One last, we bring this home. The age is set up like a Hebrew year. The great event of the age, the, great, the first great event, took place on the first great Hebrew holy day given by God, Passover. Messiah died as the Passover lamb. Everything always begins with Passover. So the whole age did. On the holy day of Shavuot, God poured out the Spirit on the, on the church, on the people of God. That's all, the day is also called Pentecost. Hebrew holiday, in order. Then you have the summer harvest. We're in that right now. The summer harvest came after Pentecost or Shavuot. That's the time of, we are in the harvest of the gospel, the harvest of salvation. This is the time to sow the seeds and reap. That's what it's about. But the next appointed holy day on God's calendar coming is the Feast of Trumpets. You get an advanced word here. You're getting like a, a sneak peek, things to come, coming attractions. This is the next event. So that, that, this is the next event, and that's why when you, when you look at the Bible again at the end, you see all trumpets, trumpets, trumpets. Everything's happening with trumpets. This is the next one. And this is linked to the end times. That means the, the, the time we are in is all the more linked to the watchmen. It's all the more, the ministry of you as a watchman is all the more crucial now that you rise to it. The world needs you to take up the post. They, won't, they don't know it. They may not even like you, but they need you. As the mantle, your mantle as a watchman, a watchwoman. Because this age is one of spiritual sleep. Evil increasing, night is come. Darkness deepens when giving the warning is a matter of life and death. Giving the gospel is a matter of life and death. When the day is near and the king's coming is nearer. The watchman is appointed for his time or her time here. You are not just here on earth. You are appointed to be here. You were born at this time to be here at this time, saved at this time for such a time as this, to be the watchman appointed for this time. You are the watchman of this generation. There's no other watchman. You are the watchman of America. They, America can't keep America, doesn't know what's going on. But you are the watchman. You, only, you alone have the answer. You are not here to ignore this generation or just to condemn it you are here not to fear this world not to not to join it not to run from it not to get into it you are here to save it to give it the chance of salvation don't fear you just give it the you're here you've got it already you don't have to worry you're here to bless them do your job do your fulfill your calling it is great and mighty. God will bless the watchman. He'll give you times of intimacy you've never had. He'll give you times in his presence. He will honor you as you fulfill this call. But give the flow out with the gospel. He'll flow in with the spirit in his presence. For the Lord would say to you, I have set you as my watchman on the walls. Do not keep quiet. Lift up your voice and do not be silent. For you were born for this mantle. This most high and honored calling to be a voice crying out in the wilderness, proclaiming from the walls, prepare, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Let every valley be exalted and every mountain and hill be cast down. Let the crooked way become smooth and the rugged, rugged way a plain and let the glory of the Lord be revealed and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. Hi, I'm Jonathan Kahn, and I hope you were blessed with the video. Make sure you hit the subscribe button and tap the bell icon so you're notified every time a new video is posted. Feel free to share your reactions with your comments and how you were blessed, and share this video with your friends. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. So the weapon against the enemy's music, his piping and drumming, the best one is for you to sing a new song. Not just not go along with it, sing a new song for you to praise God all the more. And there's not only that you don't have to go along with it, but there's actually a way of nullifying it. If a symphony is rehearsing and one person keeps playing the wrong note, the conductor's going to stop and going to find out who, okay, who's the wrong note. Okay, stop that. But there's a good thing in this. There's a key. Because when the devil is conducting his symphony, you need to play the wrong note. The note that doesn't fit in and you will disrupt that evil thing. Look at the righteous in Babylon when they were to bow down. They played the, 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 the sound and they had to bow down to the idol. And those few who said, no, I am not bowing down, they disrupted the whole thing. 
Look at Elijah who wouldn't bow down to Baal. He disrupted the entire government. One person. One person. That's why the enemy is so much trying to cancel believers now because it just takes one person or a few people to defy the whole system. Not only in culture but in relationships in your life. When there's a symphony of anger, you are to play a note that breaks that up, messes it up, a note of love. Symphony of bitterness, you are to play a note of forgiveness to mess it up. The more it doesn't fit in, the more it's going to disrupt the devil's tune. You've got the power to stop playing in that ensemble. The whole thing will break down. Because it's not just that you're not to play that part anymore. But when you don't, the song can't go on as it did. There was a, a, a true story in, in counseling. A family that would, was in this battle always accuse each other and blame each other and blame each other. And one, one of them became a believer. But they were, still in this, in the, they were still in the pattern. You might be a believer, but you're still in that. And one day they were, they were closing. One day the guy, and the guy, instead of going back, he said, you know what? You're right. I'm sorry. And the whole thing broke down. And there came healing. The beginning of healing broke down. They couldn't, when someone's saying, I'm sorry, they couldn't do it. The secret police in communist countries imprisoned and tortured believers. They expected them to fear or hate. That's the tune. That's the tune. But instead, the, the real, the holy among them, the believers in prison, they actually, they, they said, no, I'm not going to hate them and I'm not going to fear them. I'm going to love them. I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to share the gospel when they try to do this to me. And they, and they did and they, they, over, they changed the system. They changed, they changed their, their prison cell. They changed it and people got saved. A little child in a communist country came to the, the, the secret police who killed their, the father of the child with flowers. And they said, what are you doing? They said, well, my, my parents taught me to love our enemies. Man in charge of raping the women prisoners expected fear, intimidation, as he intimidated them, hatred, bitterness, but the woman he was, he, was, he was threatening didn't cower, but expressed pity on him. And mercy said, why, why are you not? And she begins to share God's love with him. He gets saved. Literally gets, gets saved. Someone strikes you on the cheek, that's the tune. You strike them back, you're playing the tune. You, someone strikes you on this cheek and you fear and you get all depressed, you're playing the tune. What, you know, does it, you know, but when you turn the other cheek, you're breaking it up and you're coming with something else. You may have had a tough childhood, and these, but you don't have to play the tune of it for the rest of your life. Amen. I remember one years ago at a service, I, I, when I used to lead worship, we were singing, We Exalt Thee. We exalt thee, we exalt you. And I'm stunned. I'm playing. I'm saying, what's going on? I heard a whole other choir of voices. At least, it was, it was like at least one third of the congregation singing a different song that paralleled the song, that wove around the song, and a different rhythm that fit perfectly into the song. I was amazed, and I'm thinking in my head, I could not, but I'm saying, what's going on? Did, a, did we get this whole like delegation from another church that knew a whole nother song that was made to go with this song? And I couldn't figure it out, but there wasn't any. I'm saying, who is it? Who's that? At the end of the service, a woman who's very sensitive to spiritual things said, did you see the angels worshiping today? I said, no, but I heard something. There is definitely music in heaven. And the Bible says it's not just to not go along with it. The Bible says, sing to the Lord a new song. A new song. The word for tof, tambourine, linked to the enemy, but it's also linked to the praise of God. The tambourine, the symbol, the timbrel, so the weapon against the enemy's music, his piping and drumming, the best one is for you to sing a new song. Not just not go along with it, sing a new song for you to praise God all the more. For you to sing to him a new song. Interesting. That new song, actually we sang a new song. I didn't plan it. That was Eliezer. It went with a, with a message on Friday, but it also, went with a, it also said that my, my praise is a weapon. It's for you to sing to God, for you to sing a new song. An instrument make it says no matter what's going on. Listen to that song. That was the Lord. That, that in every situation in the storm, I'm going to praise even more. The, an instrument makes music by vibration. But everything produces vibration. You know that? From planets to electrons, your life produces a vibration. And from a vibration comes music or a song. What kind of song are you playing? What kind of song is your life producing? 
Are you making a new song? Are you just going on with the old song? Are you blending in? Are you playing your own? From God, it's written, make melody in your heart, it says. Your heart is a musical instrument. It's not enough to, to not sing the devil's song. You must sing the song of God, a new song to the Lord. That's your own song. It's a song of your life that God is giving you to your heart. It'll drown out the devil. That's the best way to deal with everything. You're not here to play along with the, the music of the world you're, or the song of your circumstance or the song of your problems. You're here to act upon the world and you, to, make, to make it with your life a song of praise of heaven. Don't dance to the old. Lead with a new song. Wherever you go, don't wait for that unloving, negative, purse, angry person to start playing the one that, you know, loving you. You take the initiative when there's nothing there. You play God's song to them. Don't react to the darkness. Act upon the darkness with the light of God. Ble that's the new song. Bless those who curse you. That's the new song. Shine to the world. Pray for those who persecute you. That's the new song. Surprise them. Surpr a song of praise. You're in a horrible situation. I'm singing a song of praise and victory. Just as it is written, praise Him with a trumpet sound. Praise Him with harp and lyre. Praise Him with stringed instrument and flute. Praise Him with tambourine and dancing. Praise Him with loud cymbals. Praise Him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise Him with all that you are. Sing a new song to the Lord and drown out the devil's pipes. We must decide. I will go to the higher ground. That's the only way the life of God is blessed. The only way that it comes. You want a joyful walk? You need to keep going higher. You need to get, and if you're not joyful, and if you're listening to this and say, oh, I'd rather just stay where I, well, you're not going to be joyful, and you wonder why you're not. You want to be joyful? Move ahead. Move ahead. Because God is calling you to move ahead. God is calling you to victory. Because that is what God says. That's what His will is for you. And because God is calling us as a people, as a congregation, to higher ground. There are times, there are special times when there are specific callings to higher ground. In my life, I look back, I saw like four seasons where God was just moving. The first one in my life was when He called me, when I was a teenager, to come to Him. And I was fighting, and I was trying to stop it. And I had my own plans. And I, I tried to make a deal with him. I tried to do everything to keep him at bay. But finally, as some of you know, I was hit by a train, literally. And then I was kind of forced. I, I, I came to the Lord on a mountain, which was like higher ground. And, and then God started changing my life. It was a challenge to walk on higher ground. Without getting saved, without being born again, you can't even do anything. But I had to step out. When you, you have to step out in the Lord. I had to step out, and there was a greater responsibility now on me because I was walking in God. Same with you. When I was about, the second time when I was about to graduate college, I decided, what do I do in my life? And the Lord interrupted the last year of college by giving, by calling me to ministry. He interrupted. It was powerful. It was supernatural. And he said, ministry, and I'm calling you. And so it was a challenge to, again, move to higher ground. Now depend on God. I had to, I had to decide what to do. I depend on God for everything, knowing that it would come, but I saw nothing. I mean, I saw nothing that I thought I could figure out, but I had to trust God. The Lord said, step out, trust me, come. And the third time was when I was called into ministry with Beth Israel. I was working with disabled children, and I knew that there'd be a time that I would leave there for full-time ministry because of what God had told me. I knew that. But years had gone by. I was ministering in all different ways, but then one time I knew my time was up. And the scripture kept coming to me from Deuteronomy 8 where God said, I'm about to bring you into the promised land. And now you're going to know why I had to humble you. I had to put you in the wilderness. I had to have you in there and I had to teach you that man doesn't live by bread alone, but you depend on me. Because when I bring you into the land, you gotta, land, you gotta know, when I bless you, you have to know it's from me. And not get comfortable, not trust in what you have, trust in me. The same God who kept you in the wilderness will keep you there. And so he kept giving me this scripture before it happened, and then all of a sudden, Gary calls me up 
one day, and 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 I was kind of sick that day, and he and he said, "Come on, I have to meet you." You know, he called me th like three times before I even got home. It was like three messages from Gary. So I said, "This is strange for Gary to call me like that." And so then he called me to a diner, and then said, "Listen, you know, the pastor's leaving, and we have to. I'm asking you to become pastor." And and, I, and a lot of you know, I said no. That was the first thing I said. I said, "No, no, I can't. The call, I I can't because God's called me." It's not Beth Israel. It's called, I'm helping Beth Israel, but uh, you know God's called me. I never thought it was Beth Israel. I can't. So I'm saying I can't answer the call, Gary, because of the calling. He's saying, well, what if the calling is the calling? The calling is the calling. I, I never thought of that. The calling being the calling. That's. So I said I'd pray about it, and I remember I was leaving the diner, and I just turned on the radio, and something came on. The, I mean, that moment, someone I won't go into now, but something was said that like, whoa, just blew me away. And I remember Gary and I just watching the hand of God move powerfully and having a sense of awe. Oh, I remember every night we'd go, when, when we would go to our homes and go to bed, we'd be exhausted just from what God was doing. It was not easy because everything was in, looked like everything was going to fall apart and was in flux, but God's hand. He was calling us to higher ground, but that means you've got to trust me. Step out. I, had, I left my job to go to the congregation, which could never really support Anyone. It was about 35 people. It was an outreach of a church at that time. It wasn't even an independent congregation. And it was a little outreach on, on Friday night. And it was shaky and it was almost closed down. And then it was closed down. And that's when I was asked to, to do it. But the Lord is saying, no, take me seriously. Commit everything to me. Walk. Walk out. Walk. And God did it. God started doing one thing after the other. And the, and the last time, and I mean, there's many, there's many times in our lives, but major, time, major seasons is now. What we saw in the nations was so beyond, and I brought back some of it, and there were times we were just been blown away, was so beyond, and I, we can't even still put it together. Those, those who have seen it and those who have heard it, it's still beyond what God is doing and what he is going to do. God is calling us to higher ground. Now he's calling you anyway every day to higher ground. But all the more we need to do it because he's calling us for something. Calling us to be a light to nations. It is now. And it's all getting ready. And things are already happening, but it's moving. People are now being banned from the web for writing things that are basically the gospel. People have lost their jobs for write, simply putting, posting on their personal site what the Bible says. Amazon, just in those last two weeks, started removing books, censoring books. Basically, a, a writer this week who said she had been freed from sexual sin, she was banned, her book was banned. Hitler's writings are on the web, but not that. In California, they came that close to banning, by this, the way the law was written, banning the sale of Bibles and, and enacting a law that would have ultimately eliminated Christian schools or Bible schools in the state. It didn't pass, but almost, but there are other acts happening, including the, the, the push right now in the Democratic Party for the Equality Act, which it has a nice name, but it has a very dangerous effect on all religious freedom. Um, so much so that all Christian schools in America and Christian are in danger right now because of just a few little changes in the law and they will all be forced to make a decision to either give up what the Bible says, or give up their funding, which on which is about forty to sixty percent of their funding, which could end most religious education in America. You need to be aware of it. You need to pray. In California, I mentioned. Well, actually, it's just in the last few weeks, they one part of their legislator passed a law telling pastors what to speak about. And it would seem with all these things that you see, it would seem that, that believers are powerless against it and can sometimes feel like that. But in the book of Acts, they were also told what they could do and what they couldn't do. 
But they had to make a decision and they said, well, basically, if it's a question between what God says and what you say, we're going with God. We have to do the same thing. If it comes to that, we have to do the same thing. But we are not powerless. You can, we're going to, you know, we're, we're talking about the ways of man and there's powers in the ways of man, but that's not our kingdom ultimately. So I'm going to, I want to look today about the powers that you have that are given specifically by Messiah to his disciples. If you're a follower of the Lord, you are his disciple. And so Matthew 10 says this, Yeshua, Jesus, summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Now the names of the 12 apostles were, are, the first Shimon, Simon, called Kepha, Peter, and Andrew, Andreas, his brother, Yaakov, James, the son of Zabdi, Zebedee, Yochanan, John, his brother, Philip, and Bartalme, Bartholomew, Tomai, Thomas, Matthew, Matthew, the tax collector, Yaakov, James, the son of Alphaeus, Tadai, or Thaddeus, Shimon, the zealot, Simon, Yehuda, Iscariot, Judas, the one who betrayed him. These twelve, Yeshua, Jesus sent out after instructing them, don't go into the ways of the nations or the Gentiles. Don't enter any city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Freely you received, freely give. Okay. First thing. It wasn't that they were prepared. It wasn't that they, it wasn't that they went to Bible school. None of them did. They were with the Lord, but he just now sends them out. And often the Lord, you know, a lot of things that are keeping us sometimes or keeping you maybe from fulfilling your calling is that, well, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. Well, the Lord usually puts out before we feel we're ready. If you're going to follow God, he's going to put you out before you feel you're ready to do what he has you to do. And sometimes you have to just step out and you'll learn you most of it. And the Lord is learning as you go. That's what he did there. He, he, he brought them. He just go out and do these things. Now there's no, there's no examples before that they were doing those things, but he said, do those things. And God calls us to do things that we did not do, have not done, are not comfortable doing, not, not, who we were, but now who we're becoming. So you have to step out. If you want to fulfill your calling, you have to step out in God. There's so much to do, but Messiah gives authority here. He gives a mission, but he doesn't give a mission without authority. He said at the end of the gospel, therefore go into all the earth. Why? He says, because all authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. Therefore you go. There's something about going on a mission for God. And I'm not saying just overseas. I'm saying yes, overseas, but here too, everywhere. Going on a mission, moving forward in the Great Commission, where you are given a supernatural authority. When I've been on mission trips, I've saw this principle again and again. You see things that you don't see when you're not stepping out in God. I mean, we saw people who were maybe shy here, and they go on the mission field, and they are anointed with power. And their, their doors open. And we are, and it's, it's amazing. You know, and here's the principle. I once did a teaching on the private and the general, and it's simply this, that who has the most authority in, a, in an army? The general. Who has the least authority? A private. So that's it. God's the general. We're the privates. We don't have a lot of authority. Not in our will we don't. But if the general gives an assignment to the private, the private has the authority of the general. If the general gives a paper to the private to deliver, that, that private, as much as he's doing the will of the general, has the authority. The doors have to open. Everybody has to yield to that private. The same with you. We're privates, but if we're doing our own will, not authority. But if you're, the more you're doing the will of God, the more you are given authority, the authority of God, the king of kings, to do God's will. 
So the key is get your life into his will. And get your life more and more into his will. And one part of being in his will is serving him. If you're not serving in ministry in some way, you're not fulfilling the calling God gave you. You're not in the perfect will of God. It's just what he said. There's not people who are ministers and people who are not. Everybody's a minister in the Lord. We're here to equip you, but you are a minister if you're born again. And you've got an authority, but... The, what is the ultimate will of God is the Great Commission. When he left, he said, this is what I will you to do. So the Great Commission is getting, the go getting people saved, spreading the gospel, healing, blessing. Giving them, that's what it is. That is. You want the will of God? Get into that. Because there's going to be a power and authority and a blessing when you go. And he said, as you go, the Greek tense there means it is continuous as you are going in going. The, you know, there's a thing about this. It's not just the special missions, but whatever you're doing, as you're just going in the Lord, there is a mission for you. There are opportunities everywhere you go. You go to the store, there's a great commission in the store. You may not be using it, but it's there. You go to the bank, there's a great commission there. You go on into a family reunion, there's a great commission. It may seem hard, but it's still there. Never forget that whatever you're doing as you're going, we're all on mission. You say, well, I'm not really a missionary. Yes, you are. If you're born again, you are. You say, well, I don't know what the mission field is. The mission field is called planet Earth. That's your mission. You are born of heaven. You are on Earth, not because you're home, because you're on mission. I remember once I was getting shoes, and I had to get shoes, and I went to a store, um, went to Sears, I think, and I was one step up. I usually would go to Walmart, but I was being, I was being uh, fancy that day, and, and, and I went to a saleswoman. She's looking at me strangely. She's getting me shoes, and I, I says, she says, do I know you? I said, well, I said, well I, I've seen you. I said, okay, maybe you watch television. I said, yeah. I said, and, and, and we're talking, and turns out it's an Israeli. As a really woman who was into the occult and all these things like that. But she seems real cautious. But I talked to her. But I give her a card. I had, a, I had a, like a God loves you card. We got to make them up again. And I gave, it, I gave it to her. And I'd never heard of her. She was very kind of cautious. But months later we get a letter. It's from the woman who gave me the shoes. And she was why She looked at the card. She watched me on television. And she says, I have to come out. She comes out. She gets saved. And she became part of the congregation when she was here. Everywhere you go, there's a great commission. You won't, there's like, it's like, and there's an adventure to it because if you take the first step, it leads to the next step and the next step and the next step. It's like one door opens the next, and the next. You step out, you share the word. One door opens the next door, opens the next door. But if you don't open that door, you're never going to see any of the doors. As you go, you have the, we are all on mission, the Lord tells his disciples. He said, preaching, as you go, preach the, God, preach the kingdom, preach the gospel. Now we think, well, you know, I'm not a preacher, it doesn't matter. It's talking about spreading what you know. You, you know, say, so, well, I, I don't know how to witness. Yes, you do. If you go to court, if you see an accident and you go to court, and they say, well, did you see the accident? You say, I don't know how, are you a witness? You say, I don't know how to witness. You just say, I saw the accident, you're a witness. You say, I, this is what it was. The same with the Lord. You don't have to have a book on it, that's great. But all you have to do is bear witness of what you know about Jesus in your life. What you know about Him, that's it. So it's not that, in, and if they were preaching then, the world needs it at least as much now, because now we're in an anti-phase. And so all the more we need to open our mouths and spread the word of salvation. Believers often live as if they have no power, afraid of everything. You know, the devil, the devil. Yeah, the devil's out there, and he has his schemes, but he's not the focus. We're aware of, we're aware of darkness, but we have to remember we are not under the darkness, and we're not on the losing side of darkness. We're on the winning side of darkness. Amen. Messiah, you know, Messiah didn't command weakness. We may be weak in ourselves, but he commanded power. He commanded authority and power to his disciples. 
And notice what happens. First is the will of God. He says, go out, do this. Then he says, and you will be doing this and you will have this power. So the first thing is the will of God and then comes the power of God. First comes the will of God and then comes the miracles of God. You can't have the power and the miracle without the will. Not that you're going to be perfect, but the more you are in out of the will, the less power you're going to have. The more you're in the will, the more power, the more blessing. People say, you know, come and, you know, I follow the miracle, come to the miracle service. We're not supposed to be following miracles. We're following the Lord. The miracles are supposed to be following us. Follow the will of God and the miracles follow the power follows. He said, greater works will you do. The power is not about us, it's about him and it's a matter of authority. All authority, he didn't say some, he said all authority in heaven and on earth are given to me. It means all. Does, does it mean it's going to look like it? No. A lot of times it won't look, it look like it for Paul. A lot of times he's in prison. No, it didn't look like it, but it still was the real thing. Paul was in prison, yet he changed the world more than, than the highest Caesar of his age. It's a matter of the real authority of God. Some believers think that they can say whatever they want and the authority follows them. No, the authority doesn't, the authority, uh, you know, in other words, I say this, I want this, or, no, I rebuke this. Or, you can rebuke anything you want, but if it's not God's will, it's not going to happen. But if it's God's will, yes, rebuke, I mean, God will rebuke, rebuke the enemy. If it's God's will, yes, command that, because it's God's will. There are people, you know, when the, when the apostles said, get up and walk, they knew it was God's will at that moment. You know, the stories of superheroes, you know, with superpowers, Superman flies and a flash runs and Plastic Man bends and all these things. Spider-Man is a spider. I don't know. But in God, it's all, of course, just a fantasy, but interesting. You know who most, you know, you know who wrote, who created most of those, those comic heroes, superheroes? Jewish people. You know why? Because they're the people who need the Messiah. And without the Messiah, they still long for the superhero. Superman, Jewish, a Jewish guy. Even his name, Kalel, it's, it's Hebrew, you know. Batman, Jewish, Spider-Man, Jew, all that. The people who wrote. Because, but what it's telling you, no, there's a reason for that. People are telling you, you have all those three superpowers linked to that. But the re that's the imitation, that's the fantasy, but the real one that they're longing for is Yeshua, is Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus. He's the real one, and he has real power, and the real power is given to you, his disciple. That's better. See, all that stuff is fantasy and special effects, but this is not special effects. This is the power of God, and it's real. So he's giving that to you, true power. And so the disciples are the ones who are given the power. And if you're alive, if you're a follower of the Lord today, you're his disciple. So I want to just look at a few of the powers he gave you right here. The first power he gives in the Greek is called therapio, which 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 means the it's the power of healing, of making whole. Of, of making well what is broken. People in the world, broken. It's a broken world. It's a messed up world. You have been given the power of therapeuo, the power of healing. Now, does that mean everybody, you're a miracle here? Every time you say, it doesn't mean that, but it means that God will use you to bring healing. In his manner, in his will, as he wills in your life. And as he wills in people's lives. It's the same word, which means to heal, the power of healing, also means to serve and help people. Serve, or like waiting on tables. There's something, there's a connection between, between serving God and having the power of healing. But there's another word that comes from that, that power that God gives you. And the word is therapeuo, you can, you can hear it, therapy. The, you know, the world says you need therapy, you know. They made studies on therapy, and I'm not speaking for or against, but they, they made studies on therapy. They found out a third of the people got better. A third stayed the same, and a third got worse. And the third who got better might have gotten better anyway, we don't know. Now I'm not saying there's good Christian counsel from the Word of God, but be careful 
Yeah, there are many tenets of psychology that are opposed to the Word of God, so be careful. Don't just put your, your life in the hands of somebody who's giving you spiritual counsel. But we have a Messiah who's a healer. Better than therapy is to be with Messiah. He's, you want a therapist? He's your therapist. The love of God heals, really does. You don't want to see people getting together. You see people who are messed up. They come to the Lord and they really get into God. And, they, and, and, and you see them totally change from what they were because God is our healer. The Son of God will arise with healing in His wings. The same word, interesting, therapeuo, power of healing, also can mean, be translated as worship. What does that mean? There's a connection between worship and and healing. You want healing? Get into worshiping God. There's healing in worship. In fact, there's healing of getting your eyes off your problem. There's healing in getting your eyes off of yourself and getting lost in the love of God. There's a story I've I've known about it. It struck me from when I first heard it. I heard the guy share it. A guy who was totally mentally ill and so he was diagnosed like paranoid, schizophrenic, and he was put on shock therapies years ago and all this stuff and nothing healed him. And he got saved and he still wasn't healed. And so finally he, he looked at the scripture, popped out at him. It said, put on the mind of Messiah. And he said, what's the mind of Messiah? The mind of Messiah is to be praising the Father. So he said, every day I'm going to take an hour and I'm just going to praise the Father. I'm not going to bring my problems. I'm not going to bring any of that. I'm not going to tell them what I want. I'm just going to get into praising the Father. And I believe about a year later, within a year, he was totally healed. Totally. To this day, he's a minister now. From that, the power of healing. Every believer, if you're, you're a believer, you are to in some way bring healing to someone else. If you are, you know, in some way, you, the effect of your life is to be healed. Sometimes it's a supernatural, physical healing, but it's other kinds of healings. But if you're an agent of healing, then that means you also have to have healing. Heal thyself, physician, you know, it says. Don't try to fix others until you fix yourself. At least, you know, the, the, you know, you've got the power of healing. The Bible says you've got the power of healing. So if you have the power of healing, it's for other people, but it's also for you. Let the power of Messiah bring healing to you because that's because it does. And I've seen that and I've seen, I mean, we have seen all kinds of healing. And, and listen, we can't tell God what to do. I can't say that every time you want something, you're going to get that healing. I, I can say that God heals and God blesses and God gives you what you need. And the best way, whether it's through an, an immediate miracle, a long miracle, or a miracle that was something you didn't expect that was better than the miracle that you did in the long run. But we prayed for people, we've seen it right away, they got instantly healed. Now it doesn't happen, doesn't happen all the time, but it happens. We've seen people who are, who are diagnosed blind and were healed. Like that. But, as, but the point is, it's not about that, because those miracles are all going to be, the people are going to die at one time or another. Okay? So physical healing is part of it, but it's a sign of the deeper healing that God does forever. So those healings are part of it, but they are not the, the main thing. The main thing is it's showing you the power of the healer that you have as your Savior. The next second power that he said in there, it's the power of Katharizo. All right, try it. <laughs> Katharizo. I don't know, I think you're better at the Hebrew. Uh, I'm not sure. Katharizo, Greek. Well, he said here, what does that mean? It means the power, literally, of cleansing. There's commercials, you know, our, our brand, we have the more cleaning power. Well, we're in Messiah. We have Messiah, and Messiah has more cleaning power. The power of Katharizo. He said, you shall cleanse the leper. Now that's a priestly act. Back then it was the priests who were linked to the cleansing of the leper. But basically it says on the day that the leper is healed, the leper would be healed. It's called cleansing, but it was also his healing. 
It was cleansing because they're cleansed of their impurities. They're cleansed of all the junk of leprosy. They're cleansed. So when it's healed, the priest will say, yes, he's clean. And they will then, they will then reinstate the one who was the leper. But Messiah takes it to another dimension. He doesn't just say, You're, okay, this person got healed. He, the, the leper was, was not healed. And the leper runs up to him and he says, he runs up to him to touch him, I mean, to come close. And you're not supposed to do that as a leper. You're supposed to stay away from everybody. Runs up to him and he said, he said, you can, you can heal me, Messiah, Jesus. You can make me clean, meaning, and he, he, he says, is if you're willing, and he, he said, I am willing, touches him, not supposed to do that, he's healed. So Messiah takes it to another level. The priest couldn't do that. The priest could just say he, they're healed. Messiah takes what is, what is unclean and makes it clean. And that's bigger. That's better. You know, because if you go to the supermarket, you'll see some things that say, this is kosher, this is not kosher, this is kosher, this is not kosher. And it says, some of them say, it's under the, this was kosher prepared under the supervision of Rabbi Shlomo Schwartz, you know, whatever it is. Well, well, rabbis can say, this is kosher, this is not. But we have the only rabbi in, in the universe who can take what's unkosher and make it kosher. Like us. You know what I'm saying? Messiah takes what is not clean and makes it clean. He takes lives that are not clean and makes it clean. He is the power of cleansing, katharizo. And that's all part of the power. Like when he takes somebody who's outcast, he takes somebody who's a prostitute, takes somebody, the power of restoration. It's the power, you know, the, the priests were in charge of washing. John the Baptist was born of the priestly line. He was in charge of the washings, the Catharizos, power of purifying purity to pronounce clean. This is also the power of forgiveness because it's making somebody clean. Well, God, Messiah is saying, you now have that power. This is the power that's even, that's the priestly power, but it's even greater than the priestly power. You know, the Bible says you're a priest. Well, you also have the power of the priest. It's the power to make unclean things become clean. It's the power of forgiveness. You know, those who should not, who don't deserve it, but you give it to them. You, to make them clean. You know, Messiah said to the, to, you know, he said, your sins are forgiven. And they said, how dare you say that to that man? Only God can forgive sins. And he said, okay, all right, God. The guy was paralyzed on the floor, paralyzed, couldn't move. He said, okay, so that you might know that I have the power to forgive sins, get up and walk. And the guy gets up and walks. The point, and you say, wow, you know, the paralyzed guy gets up and walks. Everybody's amazed. But it wasn't about that. It was about the power to forgive sins. He's saying that's greater than this power. But that you might know, you know, you know when, when, you, when it says that the Lord forgives you, you may not see something, you may not feel something. Like if he, he just healed you of being paralyzed, you'd see it. Everybody would go, wow. But the greater power is him forgiving you. And it's, it's even more real. Even though you may not see him do it, you don't see something change physically. It's more important. And it's more real. That when you say God forgives you, when you say God forgive me, it's real. You can take it. It's more important than being paralyzed and getting healed. But the Lord says that's for you. But he says now you have that power too. Not only it's the power, you know, it is, it's the same word that's used in Hebrews 9, 23, when, it's, when it speaks of things being ceremonially clean, cleansed, so vessels could be used of God. Well, it says that if we are cleansed, we can be used for God's purposes. If you get, if anyone cleanses himself, he will be, or she will be a vessel of high honor and purposes. So God has a high purpose. Well, God has given you power to cleanse our people around you, to, to bring cleansing into them. And not that you can't force them, but you have the power. You're the power of your life is to make things that were unclean become, make situations that were unclean become clean. But it starts with you getting clean and me getting clean and we getting cleansed from God so we can be used to our highest calling, the power. You can't force people to be clean. You can't force people to do that. 
But you have a power from the Holy Spirit. You've got a power that moves things toward rightness, to cleansing. If you go with the Spirit, take situations that are so, that are, that are so messed up or so dysfunctional, and you've got power in it. You know, they, 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 you have power to take away things that are impure and become pure. Starting with the impurity in your life, you've got power to become pure if you will take it. They advertise on television, this gets the stains out. <laughs> Any good cleaning agent supposed to get the stains out. Blood stains, mud, you know. So the, thing, the, the mother's there and the kids are running in the mud and gets the stains out. The power of Messiah is not just the power to put away sin. It's the power, it also gets the stains out. You see, because sin stains. Sin stains our lives, it stains emotions, it stains people's way of thinking, it's, the stain is guilt, the past. Well, Messiah has the, the power of Katharizo is to get the stain out, not only the sin, but what the sin has done. Not only the sin, but the guilt and the regret. Not only the sin, but all the messed upness that came from that sin. Though your sins be as scarlet, I will make them white as snow. The stain is gone. You've got a power from God, if you will take it, to be able to live a stainless life, a life with a stainless conscience. You have a guilty conscience? Listen, God uses guilt. It's okay to have guilt. If, it's if you're doing something wrong, you want that oil light to tell you there's something wrong. You know? you know, when an oil light goes on, when something goes on in your car, you go, okay, what's wrong, what's wrong? You don't like that feeling. You don't like, but it's a good thing that you have that. That's what guilt is. Not about that. Guilt is there to tell you something's off. That's not wrong. But if, you stay, if you're staying in guilt your whole life, there's something wrong. God wants your conscience cleansed. What's it say? In Hebrews, our, having our hearts, we can boldly go into the presence of God, having our hearts sprinkled clean from a guilty, evil conscience. We've got a power from God. You got it if you want it. The power to cleanse the stain of bitterness and unforgiveness in your life. To cleanse the stain of rejection in your life. To cleanse the stain of, of abandonment in your life. To cleanse the stain of anxiety and fear and wounds in your life. To cleanse the stain of saying you're never going to be any good and you're always going to be a failure even in God. You have the power to cleanse that stain. Messiah, Messiah gets the stain out. And you've got the power to. What kind of lamb is the Messiah. What kind of lamb? A spotless lamb. Right? Passover. Spotless lamb. He is spotless so you can become stainless. That's the power of the lamb. Use it. Use it. Note how many times in Scripture cleansing or forgiveness and cleansing is linked to healing and miracles. Your sins are forgiven rise and walk. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Be thou cleansed. Be made whole. That's the power that God has for you to use. Third power, or next power, the power, ready for this, the power of ekbalo. That's kind of, it's not so hard. Ekbalo. Kind of sounds happy. Ekbalo. What is that the power of? You know, there's a lot of talk about the enemy and a lot of talk about the darkness and all those things. And, and indirectly, a lot of times believers talk as if they're victims, you know, of people, yeah, but also of the devil and also of all the things that happened in their lives and what's going on. And what. But the Bible says, Messiah said to you, if you're his disciple, you have the power over the enemy to trample him. And the power is called ekbalo. What is that? Ek balo mean, ek means out. Balo means to throw. Ek balo means you've got the power of kicking out. Casting out. Casting out. It's like the apostles where, where they came back and they were like amazed. Lord, the demons are subject to us. They couldn't believe it. I remember when, when uh, years and years ago, I'm sure... By, well, maybe the early days of when I was, when I started. And we had somebody 
who had been who got out, got saved out of dark dark things, but at one point they started falling back into it, and they were acting strange, and they were I mean and and it was I mean it was dark and and we really people their friends came and said we gotta we gotta pray for this we gotta let's fast and pray for him because there's something this is like demonic and so he said and then let's come over his house so we came over and i remember i came over and i come to him and he was kind of kind of he had been drinking and this was just one of the sins and i i said we're going to pray for you and i put my hand on his his knee because we were all sitting around to pray and he starts shaking, 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 back and forth. Back. He starts laughing, laughing, shaking, laughing. And I, I said, Lord, this has to be a prayer of casting out. And I'm praying and I'm praying and, I, and, I, and I'm praying to, that, to cast out whatever darkness this is. And he's shaking and shaking and shaking and laughing. And then the laughter starts. And then the shaking gets less and less and less and less until it's all gone. And it's peace. And he's healed of it to this day, to this day. That's the power of Ekbalo. I remember when I was in, we were in Africa and we were at the, at the shrine of a, of, a high, of, an, of a pagan high priestess woman who had been dedicated to the gods since she was a, 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 an infant. And I remember, you know, and, and, and I'm, I'm, we're leaving and she's following us around, but she's keeping her distance and someone comes up and says, no, I, I gave her a Bible. She, first she refused it, but then she took it. I said, really? I said, let me go up to her. And I had translators around. She had her attendants around, the high priestess. And, and, I, and, and I said, finally, I'm talking to her and going on and on. And she's just, she's, finally, I just said, let me just ask. I said, I said do you want to receive Jesus? She says, yes. So I pray and I make it a real long prayer and I it was a prayer of Ekbalo. I said, Lord, and I make it long. I, I rebuke this. I cast out. I renounce. I'm not going to do this anymore. This I'm out of all the darkness. At the end, I look up and she is glowing with light. I mean, glowing. We have a picture. She's glowing. At the end, I said, you know, you don't have to go by these, this darkness anymore. You've got, a, you've got the Word of God here now. You've got the oracles of God. He's going to speak to you. I, said, it's op- I just opened it up random. It opens up to the people who dwell in darkness have seen a great light. That was an ekbalo moment. You have authority by the virtue of God. Good always has the authority to drive out the darkness. There was a, a pastor who... who who was approached by a fortune teller. I mean, fortune tellers are into the occult, you know, and all that. Don't have anything to do with any of that stuff. But he, he, she, and he starts, she starts telling the fortune of the, of, of the pastor. And finally, the pastor says, okay, now I'm going to tell you your fortune. If you don't repent of this darkness, you're going to be dead. You're going to be judged. She ended up laughing. She ended up, she was murdered. It actually, real. it was a warning from God. In John 2, Messiah drove them out of the temple, the, 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 the corruption. This, the word that's used for when he drove them out is the same word, ekbalo. To, it's not just about demonic driving out. It's about the power over any evil and any darkness, anything that's not of God. We don't have a passive faith. You don't have a timid faith. You don't have a faith that accepts everything. You accept, yeah, we are to love everybody, but you don't accept darkness. You don't accept, you don't accept what Hitler was doing. You don't accept, you don't say everything. It's not. You accept, you, if you're going to love, if you're going to have light, you have to oppose the darkness. That means you have the power of ekbalo. That you don't have to put up with certain things. You can, you have the power to drive them out. To drive out darkness. And sometimes it might take more prayer. Because sometimes he says these things only come out by prayer and fasting. Some things may take more persevering. But you've got the power. You have the power to drive evil out. You have the, we have the power in our society to drive evil out. Now I'm not saying you could, we can't force people. We can't force laws and all that. But you've got power within this. Within the present darkness. You've got power to shine light. And make the darkness go away. Life by life. And whoever will hear you still have a greater power than the world. It's easy for believers to talk about it. But we have the, just, well this, this evil and this evil. You have the power to push away evil. 
And with all that's happening in the world, we need that power greater now. In the, in the days of Germany, you know, long before Hitler came, they came up with this way of approaching faith that they kept, here's the faith world, here's the pastor in your church, and then here's the rest of the world, keep them separate. Well, that opened the door for Hitler and, and the enemy. We are to have power, we are to be affecting power and shining light everywhere. You can't force people to come to God, but you have the power to drive out darkness. The children of Israel got to the promised land, what did they do? They had to drive out the giants. They had to drive out. You are born again, you're a spiritual child of Israel. You are to have the power to drive out giants. That means in your own life, you're not supposed to be living under giants, harassing that sin, that bondage, that fear, that intimidation. You're not supposed to be living under that. You're supposed to be driving it out. Amen. I'm not talking about people, but I'm talking about the sin that might be in people or around you. You have the power to draw. Light drives out darkness. Love drives out hate. I remember when we were early days, we, I went to a Bible study. I was like a year old in the Lord. And I remember the, it was a, at a pastor's house, and the, and the pastor's wife was praying with some other believers because right next to their house was this, this theater, this porno theater, XXX, triple X theater. And she said, we're just praying against that this closes down. And she, while I was there, it closed down and became a family theater. The nature of evil is to take over things that belong to you. The, the nature of evil, nature of the enemy is to try to take foothold in your home, in your walk, in your mind, in your emotions, in your life. He's always trying to take a foothold. And so you have to be strong about this. And you've got to get the power of Ekbalo to be able to say, get out. In the name of Messiah, get out of here. In the name of Messiah, you have no place and no authority over this, over my house, over my, my walk, over my calling, over anything. You have no authority, but in the name of Messiah, get out. Name of Jesus, get out. Get out, depression. Not supposed to be, not supposed to be ruling you. I'm not saying there are issues. Yep, maybe, and there may be healing, but it's not supposed to be ruling you. Get out, fear. I'm not supposed to be subject to fear my whole life. Get out that bondage, that sin that keeps coming out. Get out once and for all. Get into getting out. You know, some of you people would have liked to kick some people out of your house. But you're too nice, you never did. Get into, you can do this now. Get into kicking things out. The joy of kicking the things of the enemy out of your life. Get into the joy of it. Get out of here. Really. You know, it says, the Lord said, the Lord said, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Now, 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 he wasn't being literal, okay? He was saying, that's if anything causes you to stumble, don't let anything jeopardize your walk with God, okay? But the word here is ekbalo. <laughs> so it means get your eye out and throw it. <laughs> like this picture I'm giving you? It's hyperbole, but it's saying, it's saying you have the power to remove anything from your life that is not of God. Anything. You have the authority. That's a major thing you need. Major. And the last power is the power, I mean there's other things, but in what he just said, he commissioned you with powers. The last one is the power of Egiro. Try it. Egiro. You know what that means? That's the power of raising what is dead. Raising what is dead. Now I've heard mission stories of, re of real people, real things, of people who died and were, were, came back. I've seen it. I've, I've heard, I've, I, know, I, know, I, know a, I know a pastor who was literally in a coffin. They had buried him. They were burying him, and his, his, I don't know if it was Haiti, and his father was a, came back from a, from a, like a, it was a minister, came back, and they were, they were having, they, they were burying him, and he, he said, no, he said, and he, praying and praying, or I'm not saying you do this all, but it was God. He was praying, and he heard a cough, and he, his son came back to life. He's serving the Lord to this day. Peter, it's not about the people, it's about God. Peter raised up. Paul Raise up the guy who fell asleep on his sermon. There's some preachers who wouldn't do that. And that's embarrassing anyway. 
you know, you're being raised from the dead. Okay, that's great. But the guy who's raising you was the guy who fell asleep on and fell out the window. You know, I wasn't sleeping. I was just in deep thought. Oh, you were sleeping. You fell out. You were dead. Did Paul know that he had that power? Well, it wasn't about him. But Paul knew that there was this power and it was God. The power of Egiro to take things that are dead and make them alive again. The world is fallen. The world has, has death on it. You have the power that goes against death. You got the power that is of life that overcomes death. You have the power to take a dead relationship that is of God and, and bring it to life. You have a dead marriage, bring it to life. You have the power of a dead walk, bring it to life. You have the power of a dead, a dead life, bring it to life. Lift up the fallen. People in your life are fallen. People are in a pit. You got the power. The word means to raise up. Also means to wake up. You got the power to wake up those who are sleeping. You got the power to wake up your own life. Maybe your walk has been kind of dead and you've been kind of sleeping. You got the power to say, wake up and rise up by the power of the power of Messiah to rise. I command my life to rise up. How do you watch Popeye when you're growing up? Come on. That's why you got messed up. It was Popeye. <laughs> but the thing is, Popeye, the every time he'd be so, like, you know, he's all beaten and beaten and beaten and all that. And you're thinking, you know, and he can't get to, there's no spinach. He can't get to, it's like, Popeye, why do, you, why do you keep leaving the spinach somewhere where you can't have it? And finally he kind of sucks it through his pipe and all of a sudden it goes up and he goes up. It was spinach. You know, spinach. But that's spinach, and that is, I don't know if the people who came up with Popeye were Jewish, I don't know that. <laughs> Max Flesher, he might have been actually, but, but the point is, Messiah is the power that doesn't matter how hopeless, he's got the power to raise up. I mean, he's the one who, ri who rose up far bigger than anything you saw as a cartoon. He's real, and the power is that even when you're fallen, even if you messed up, and it's, you know, it's a matter, Lord, I'm sorry I messed up. Okay, give it to God. Yes, but also now take the power of Egiro and rise up. I I got the power to rise up. I got the power not to mess up again in that thing. I have the power not just to get back and stand and hope I don't fall again, but actually to move forward because I'm living in the resurrection power of Messiah. When Messiah rose out to bring this home, he said, all authority is given to me. All authority, therefore I give it to you. He gave you authority. The, whether you use it is the whole point. There may be, somebody is really strong, but they don't know they're strong, they're not going to live strong. If somebody's a superhero and they don't know they have the power, they're not going to have it. And same with you, because with you it's real. If a person doesn't use the power, if you don't use the power, you're not going to see it. Use the power. You can overcome. You know, in Star Wars they said, use the force. Luke, use the force. Well, this isn't Luke, this is Matthew. But it said, use the force. But in that, again, that's a fantasy, but this is reality. This is what God promised you. Use the power. And it's not only power, it's authority. God has given you authority. That means He wants you to do it. He wants you to take authority over any darkness in your life, any darkness around you. He wants you to do that. You got the authority given to you. And He said, but He said, go. As you go, you have to walk in His will, get out in what He's called you, and you're going to start seeing this more and more as you do it. That's what He promised. That's what He did. And I've seen it. I've seen it. And if you're not experiencing it, you've got to get going in God. Get moving in His will. Lord, I believe it and I'm going to start moving. I'm going to take a risk today. I'm actually going to tell the cashier that God loves her. I'm going to step out. I'm going to take a step. Take the first step. Walk in His will. And the power, the power will be given. The power of healing. The power of cleansing and making pure. The power of casting out, kicking out, giving an eviction notice. And the power of raising up. Go in His will and He will do it. God's called you as an agent of heaven on earth to heal the broken, cleanse the unclean, drive out the darkness, overcome the enemy, and raise up what is dead. Make it your purpose. It, the will of God is the power power of God and the power of God is the miracle of God. Make it your aim. Walk all the more in the will that God has for your life. Live in his authority and the life you live will be a life of miracles. Amen and amen.
Father, we praise you tonight and thank you tonight, Father, for your the word and the power and what you have given to your people. So, Lord, we ask, Father, help us to apply this, Lord, in our lives. Lord, we want to live victorious. We want to live dynamically, each of us, Lord. Lord, we don't want to live in, in defeat. So, Lord, I ask right now, touch all of us. Lord, we want to live as your disciples. Lord, I ask right now, the power of healing to your people now and through your people now, the power of cleansing, making pure, making whole, making right what is not, the power of casting out, throwing out, being finished with, and the power of rising, raising up, and rising. Father, we praise you, Lord, and thank you, Lord, and we commit even now. We're going to seek to do your will more than we have. We're going to seek to walk in your will more than we've walked. We're going to seek to do and walk in the Great Commission. Lord, for those of us who are not in ministry, we were going to rise to the calling in ministry. Father, for those of us who are not sharing your word when we go out, we're going to take a step of faith and we're going to step out. Lord, we're, we're make, we want to see your power and we want to do your will. Help us more and more, to, Lord, whatever it is that we have to bring into your will, we, we are committing to it and whatever we have to put out, put out that's not your will of our life, we commit to it. Lord, we praise you. We praise you and bless you. Bless you. Lord, right now, as our eyes are closed, listen, stay in, in God's power. Commit to greater things now. But while you're commit, while you're in God, with God's presence, right now, if you're not sure where you're going to be a thousand years from now, if you're not sure, you need to know. Jesus said you must be born again. If you're not sure you're born again, you need to be. Jesus said you must be born again. So listen, if you're not sure you are, Jesus said there's only two roads. One road leads to eternal life, and that's heaven. One road leads to eternal separation from God. That's, that's hell. The Lord doesn't only wants you. He, he came for you. He, would, he gave his life for you that you would be saved forever. And that's what it's about. But if you're not born again, you're on the wrong road. Because he said you must be born again. And you can't enter heaven unless you're born again. So if you're not sure you are, you need to be. This is for your sake right now. doesn't matter if you're Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, whatever you are. It doesn't matter. Jesus said it. This is it. This is the word of God. It's about you and him. It's about your relationship with God right now. So if you're not sure you're born again, this is for you. Listen, if you're not sure you're right with God, maybe you have been born again, but you're not, life hasn't been right with God. This is for you as well. If you're not sure, listen, that means you need to get, need to get in. Because it means you're on the wrong road heading away from God. And that's heading to the wrong place. But here's the thing. You might say, well, how long do I have to get right? The answer is you've got one heartbeat. One heartbeat. That's the only thing standing in between you and eternity. So right now, if you're not sure you're born again, you need to be. That heartbeat can stop at any moment. And once it stops, that's it. You, don't, you can't choose anymore. That's eternity. So that's why the Bible says, now is the time. Every heartbeat you have, take it like God knocking on your heart. So you, so you don't say, I'll get right tomorrow, because tomorrow may never come. You may not have tomorrow, and even if you have tomorrow, you may not be open tomorrow, but you're open now. And God is speaking to your life right now. He's speaking to your heart. And he's saying, listen, I will not reject you right now. I will not turn you away, but you need to come right now. I'm not going to turn you away, but this is your moment. Don't miss the moment. Don't let it pass you by now. The greatest thing. So I say, well, how do I do that? How do I, how would I do it? It's the thing about being born again or getting back to God or, well, it's, it's not hard at all. It's easy, actually. Very easy. But you just need to mean it in your heart. He's right here. And he's saying, come. Now is your moment. With our eyes closed, we're gonna, it's this simple. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, if you will pray, we can happen with a simple prayer to say yes to the Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes to my, Lord, I'm saying yes to my calling. Yes to your call on my life. Yes to your will. Yes to your love. From here on in, I'm going to follow you with all my heart. And Lord, come into my life and my heart. Forgive me. Make me new. The power of cleansing, the power of forgiveness, the power of healing. Come into my heart in every way. 
and I'm going to follow you as your disciple on a path of victory. Our eyes are closed. And, and the one who gave his life for you, that's what it's all about. And overcame death so you could be saved. Right now is your moment. Don't miss it. We're going to do it right now. Our eyes are closed. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, you can say it in a whisper. But say it. You can do it in a whisper, but say it. Mean in your heart. We're going to pray right now. Our eyes are closed across the sanctuary. Just repeat after me right now. A very simple prayer to say yes to God. This is everything right now. If you're not 100% sure where you're going to be a thousand years from now, it means you're going to be in the, you need to get into the right place right now is your moment. Maybe you have known God, but you haven't been in His will. You need to get back. You pray too. And maybe God is calling you to higher ground as a disciple. You pray too. Make Him receive Him in every part of your life. Let's pray right now. Our eyes are closed, and this is your moment. You don't, don't worry about anybody else. You're not going to hear them. They're going to do it in a whisper. And you too, it's between you and it's You're going to do it to the Lord. Let's pray right now. Just repeat after me as I do it up here. Just repeat after me. I'm going to do it slow enough for you to be able to do it. Just repeat after me these words, meaning your heart. Let's pray right now as you repeat after me these words. Lord God, I come to you now and I say yes to you. Yes to your call. I say yes to your love. Thank you for loving me, giving your life, dying for my sins, rising so I could be saved. Thank you, Lord. From this moment on, I'm saying yes. I turn away from the dark. I turn away from the past, and I'm turning to you. I'll follow you from this moment on. Lord, come into my life in every way. Come into my heart in every way. Give me power in every way to be victorious. And Lord, now I receive you. Forgive me of my sins. I receive the power of cleansing, the power of healing, the power of casting out anything that is not for my life, and the power from my life rising in you. I receive your love. I receive your presence in my heart. I receive. And now, Lord, thank you by this prayer and your promise, I can say, I am now blessed. I am free. I am new. I am your child. I am born again. I am saved. I'll be with you always. Lead me on. I am your disciple. Lead me on as I follow you as your disciple from this moment and all the days of my life. In the name, above every name, the name of my Redeemer, the Messiah, my Savior, Jesus. And I say, Amen and Amen. Our eyes are closed right now. Listen closely. Our eyes are closed. We're all in prayer. You prayed that prayer. It's the greatest thing you ever did. Or you prayed to come back. If it's your first time you prayed or anybody. Listen, if you prayed that prayer, and if that's the first time you really prayed that prayer, you're going to be doubly blessed because there's a gift for you as well. And you're going to be very blessed. There's a CD album. I mean, a CD, uh, a CD that's part of an album and also a book on, on the secrets of success in your life now with God. And it's going to be a free gift. But also, and I want to tell you how to get that in a second, but also... The Lord said, Jesus said, if you confess me on earth before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. So, so you have to be able to, we need to be strong here while we are here right now. This is the moment. He wasn't afraid to die for you. You can't be ashamed to live for him. So right now with our eyes closed, we need to seal this together. There's a breakthrough and a victory waiting in your life. There's a breakthrough waiting, but we need to do this biblically. And that is, you can, the prayer can't just be words. You connect it with a st one step of action. So we're going to do it together very easy. It's going to be very quick, very easy, very simple. And everybody's going to be in prayer at the same time. So people are watching, just me, a minister is here. That's it. I'm going to be doing it. So we're going to do this together. So number one, this is for your blessing right now. And you, we need to do it together. On top of it, it's also for the gifts. So, so we can get you the gifts as well. So if, it's a, if you prayed that prayer for the first time and... Uh, 
and or if you, it wasn't your first time but you like those gifts as well um, or you need you want to talk to somebody whatever it is right now together here's what we're doing right now everybody who prayed as we prayed everybody who's that together right now just slip up your hand for Jesus just quickly slip up your hand for Jesus God bless you God bless you God bless you all I'm gonna pray a blessing everybody's hand is lifted up everybody's lifting their hand Lord I ask your blessing on every hand that's lifted up have your way I ask for power I ask for victory I ask for new things right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Everybody, please still keep your eyes closed. Now, except now, you guys who, who lifted your, who raised your hand, I want you to look up. There are some people up here. They're in charge of getting you the gifts. And also answer, you have any questions, they'll answer your questions as well. So I'm going to ask them in one second to come over to you. And just, you have friends who are with you. They'll do this with you. Don't worry about anything. Everybody's still in prayer. You don't want to miss getting the gifts. They're going to show you the gifts. They're right to your left. They're right where it says prayer. It's okay. And if it's your first time, I'll meet you right after that in the welcome center. So don't worry. Right Right now, I want you guys, if you don't see anybody coming to you, look up. If you don't see anybody seeing you, just flag them down, wave them down, lift up your hand so they can see you, get you the gifts, and just slip out with them for a second. Take whoever you want. They'll go with you. It's easy. And they'll, they'll just show you the gifts over to the where it says prayer, right next to the Welcome Center. And, I'll, and if it's your first time, I'll meet you right after that in the Welcome Center. You'll be very blessed. You'll get all the rest of the gifts. And your gifts are waiting. Now, if nobody's coming over to you, we're going to stand up in a second. Just sl slip out as soon as we close in a moment after the song slip out and go to the prayer center tell them you prayed they'll do they'll get you the gifts okay and your first time i'll meet you next door god bless you everybody one last we bring this home the age is set up like a hebrew year the great event of the age the great the first great event took place on the first great hebrew holy day given by god passover messiah died as the Passover lamb. Everything always begins with Passover. So the whole age did. On the holy day of Shavuot, God poured out the Spirit on the, on the church, on the people of God. That's all, the day is also called Pentecost. Hebrew holiday, in order. Then you have the summer harvest. We're in that right now. The summer harvest came after Pentecost or Shavuot. That's the time of, we are in the harvest of the gospel, the harvest of salvation. This is the time to sow the seeds and reap. That's what it's about. But the next appointed holy day on God's calendar coming is the Feast of Trumpets. You get an advanced word here. You're getting like a, a sneak peek, things to come, coming attractions. This is the next event. So that, that, this is the next event. And that's why when you, when you look at the Bible again at the end, you see all trumpets, trumpets, trumpets. Everything's happening with trumpets. This is the next one. And this is linked to the end times. That means the, the, the time we are in is all the more linked to the watchman. It's all the more, the ministry of you as a watchman is all the more crucial now that you rise to it. The world needs you to take up the post. They won't, they don't know it. They may not even like you, but they need you. As the mantle, your mantle as a watchman, a watchwoman, because this age is one of spiritual sleep. Evil increasing, night is come. Darkness deepens when giving the warning is a matter of life and death. Giving the gospel is a matter of life and death. When the day is near and the king's coming is nearer, the watchman is appointed for his time or her time here. You are not just here on earth. You are appointed to be here. You were born at this time to be here at this time, saved at this time for such a time as this, to be the watchman appointed for this time. You are the watchman of this generation. There's no other watchman. You are the watchman of America. They, America can't keep America, doesn't know what's going on. But you are the watchman. You, only, you alone have the answer. You are not here to ignore this generation or just to condemn it. You are here not to fear this world, not to, not to join it, not to run from it, not to get into it. You are here to save it. To give it the chance of salvation. Don't fear. You just give it the... You're here. You've got it already. You don't have to worry. You're here to bless them. To your job. To your fulfill your calling. It is great and mighty. God will bless the watchman. He'll give you times of intimacy you've never had. He'll give you times in his presence. He will honor you as you fulfill this call. But give the flow out with the gospel. He'll flow in with the spirit in his presence. For the Lord would say to you, I have set you as my watchman. On the walls, do not keep quiet. Lift up your voice and do not be silent. 
for you were born for this mantle, this most high and honored calling to be a voice crying out in the wilderness, proclaiming from the walls, prepare, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Let every valley be exalted and every mountain and hill be cast down. Let the crooked way become smooth and the rugged, rugged way a plain and let the glory of the Lord be revealed and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. Hi, I'm Jonathan Kahn, and I hope you were blessed with the video. Make sure you hit the subscribe button and tap the bell icon so you're notified every time a new video is posted. Feel free to share your reactions with your comments and how you were blessed, and share this video with your friends. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.